HIV and AIDS. Welcome, everyone. 20 years. It's got to be closer. Okay. Okay, try that. Thank you. Um, it, I can't believe it's been 20 years. I was here for the first season of this, uh, if you call it a season, uh, the first round of speakers. It was amazing. And uh, Tom Waugh is, uh, I don't know how to sing his praises loudly enough. He is an amazing person, an amazing professor to have. And uh, he has kept HIV and AIDS in the public consciousness when we, so many of us wanted to forget it in the media and other places. Uh, this series has kept AIDS front and center in our consciousness. And I think for that, Tom deserves a huge round of applause. And Tom set me up with one of the guest speakers when the first year, so I had a fling with Simon Watney. <laughs> I'll never forget waking up on waking up on the fold-out couch in Tom's living room with Simon Watney. My professor, my mentor, and my pimp, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, it's gonna be a heavy evening. I can start out with a joke. Okay, so um, Tonight's unique event is United in Anger, which is a really magnificent and very important film, as you'll see tonight. Um, it's a, the present, presentation tonight is a collaboration between Cinema Politica the lec and the HIV AIDS lecture series. So before we proceed further, I'd like to invite Ezra Winton of Cinema Politica and Tom Waugh, the director of the HIV AIDS lecture series, to say a few words of welcome. Please come up. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, Cinema Politica started here at Concordia almost 10 years ago. Uh, this is our ninth year. We hold screenings every Monday night and also on other nights for special events like tonight. And um, we regularly draw audiences to political documentary that we are very proud to present that are important works that are usually underrepresented or from the margins and we're very happy to be part of uh, tonight's co-presentation of this magnificent film. And also, I just want to let you know that we have a, a few more screenings that uh, you should know about. On Saturday, in two days, in the same auditorium on Saturday night at 7 o'clock, we are showing Jai Bim Comrade. We're bringing Nan Patwardhan. He's a uh, radical political filmmaker from India. He's very controversial. His films are wonderful. And we're showing his newest film about the struggle of the Dalits in India. And then we have two more screenings, which are on our regular Monday nights. We're showing the light bulb conspiracy about planned obsolescence. And then we're wrapping everything up with We Are Wisconsin, which is a film about the first, um, the first uh, thing that happened that kicked off the Occupy movement. And actually, this semester's theme of Cinema Politica is movements, mobilization, and memory. So tonight's film is obviously part of that, and we're very happy to be showing it to all of you. Thanks. Moi, je parle en français parce que nous sommes très fiers que c'est le premier mondial de la version sous-titrée en français de United in Anger ce soir. Donc. Je ne crois pas que ça fait 20 ans, c'est vraiment incroyable, mais je dois corriger ma... Je ne suis pas le pimp de, du cycle, <rires> ni le soutenant, je, suis, je fais le réseautage du, de la série. Euh, ça, fait, ça fait 20 ans, et nos buts, comme vous savez tous probablement, c'est le, le, la conscientisation de l'Académie, de l'Université Concordia, de nos universités concerts à Montréal et des communautés qui nous entourent. Euh, au sujet de la pandémie, pa pandémie du sida qui euh, ne s'améliore pas depuis 20 ans, qui s'empire et s'empire et euh, envisage pas de solution sur l'horizon. C'est notre devoir de maintenir cette, euh, ce forum de discussion interdisciplinaire Uh, sur le sida. Donc, um, 
20 ans, plus que 80 euh, euh, invités, conférenciers invités depuis 1993 et ça continue. Merci d'être venu. C'est le scénario de Matt, je ne dois pas le maganer. Um, merci d'être venu si nombreux. Ça peut être un record pour nous, uh, sinon c'était peut-être il y a cinq ans avec uh, uh, Diamanda Gallas et tous ses fans ont, uh, ont commencé à venir uh, deux heures en avant, mais uh, probablement c'est un record. Donc merci d'être venu et uh, c'est une longue uh, soirée, une longue soirée, mais uh, je vous promets une soirée passionnante et très important. Donc, euh, sans parler plus, je retourne le, le, mic, euh, le, le micro à mon client, euh, Matt. So, just need to acknowledge a few of the HIV AIDS lecture series sponsors who allow us to uh, create this event. The principal sponsors of the VIV, the VIV Healthcare in partnership with Shire Biochem, uh, Gilead Sciences, Fugue Magazine, the President's Office of Concordia University, the Office of the Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies, the Concordia Departments of Communication, Cinema, Religion, the Simone de Beauvoir Institute, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Dean of Fine Arts, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and the Fine Arts Students Association. The friends of the lecture series include the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange, the Canadian Legal AIDS Network, the Farha Foundation, Image Nation, the Queer Film Festival of Montreal, the ACCM, and the Rezo. So I'll just explain how the itinerary will work tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce someone who's going to introduce Jim Hubbard, the filmmaker, um, and Jim will introduce his, his film, Jim Hubbard's film. Um, and after the film, please stick around because we're gonna have a question period of about 20 to 30 minutes. There will be microphones circulating for people to use, two, two microphones circulating for people to ask questions. Um, please feel free to ask your questions in either English or French. If you ask in French, we have a translator here to take care of that. Very important, please, please turn off your cell phones and all electronic devices. And please, no texting during the film. That's very distracting for the people sitting around you. Um, those, those of you who are my students have already heard this before from me. Um, also, your donations are greatly appreciated and will help with continuation of the HIV AIDS project and Cinema Politica. So if you could donate whatever you can, that'd be great. Um, the guest we've invited tonight um, to int introduce our filmmaker um, is somebody who's very dear to my heart. I've known him for many years, and um, he's one of the act, uh, members of ACT UP Montreal. Um, and he was also the first person to legally marry um, another person of the same sex in Quebec in 2004. Um, he and Rene, his, his husband, uh, fought very, very hard and put up a lot of their own money um, to fight for the right for same sex marriage in Quebec and in Canada. Um, they're the pioneers of this, among many of the pioneers. Um, and I knew Michael very, very well at my time as a cub reporter years ago at the Montreal Mirror and Extra um, when there was a rash of homophobic um, violence and murders in Montreal in the 90s. And uh, Michael was very active in meeting with gay lobby groups with the police. So he would phone me every day or two, really very diligently with full details of every meeting he'd had with police officers and the lobbying they were doing to try to get police to take the crimes more seriously. Um, and, and so I can speak from from my own personal perspective that Michael has done so much amazing work for so many communities in our city. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael Hendricks. Congratulations, thanks you for coming. It's amazing, really, I must compliment you. Oh boy, okay, here we go. Jim Hubbard is a uh, New York City-based filmmaker and member of ACT UP, whose films have been shown at festivals in Berlin, the real one in Berlin, uh, London, New York, Tokyo, Hamburg, uh, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, among others. Born in Brooklyn in 1951, he studied at the San Francisco Art Institute and began, uh, began making films in 1975. He's made lots of films, several with fascinating titles like Homosexual Desire in uh, Minnesota, and tonight he will, we will see his latest, United in Anger, A History of ACT UP, that is ACT UP New York. Uh, in 1987, 
He was one of the founders of Mix, the New York uh, Lesbian and Gay Experimental Film Video Festival, at that time film, and he is a real film archivist. That's a, that means he takes care of other people's films and not just his own. Uh, in 1987, at the New York Pride March, as a member of ACT UP, he started shooting in 16 millimeter. Over time, he accumulated a lot of great footage about an incredible moment in our collective history. And besides Mr. Hubbard, there were a lot of other filmmakers and videos who were also shooting. And so it was that ACT UP was caught in the act from hundreds of points of view. In 2001, he teamed up with Madame Sarah Schulman and founded the ACT UP Oral History Project in an attempt to capture the collective memories of the surviving actors who created ACT UP and made it what it was in New York City, across the United States, and there were a lot of them, in Montreal, and still today in Paris. That oral history, coupled with a marvelous collection of action footage of ACT UP, both his own and by others, became the backbone of the film we will see tonight, a film I've been waiting for forever, at least since Sarah Schulman visited Concordia five years ago and teased us with a few clips. Before I present him, and it's my pleasure to present him, let me give you, we're going to give him two souvenirs of Montreal. First, the first prevention pamphlet ever printed in French the Barassa government refused to, at that time in 1990, 80s and 90s, refused, to, it's upside down, ah, bon, merci. Uh, the, they refused to uh, disseminate information about prevention of HIV because they said it would encourage homosexuality and drug use. ACT UP printed 10,000 of these things and distributed them extensively in the city of Montreal, which left them, you know, sort of embarrassed, and they started to print things, thank God. Second of all, a real, Act Up Montreal t-shirt, made in 1972, 1992. I, th I think we were all a bit slimmer then, but I don't know. Uh, it's now your turn, okay, take it away. Oh, th thank you, Michael. That was one of the best introductions I've ever had. This is, um, this is great because, um, you know, in order to uh, uh, make this film, we had a um, Kickstarter campaign. <clears throat> and one of the things I gave away for the Kickstarter campaign was my Silence Equals Death sweatshirt. So now I have a replacement. So I'm very happy. Um, the, there's, you can put the, aha! Uh, Okay, um, let me see. Can, uh, this is far more formal than I'm used to doing. Um, I've never done a PowerPoint presentation before. So uh, usually I just get up and blab, you know? Um, but, but this is great. Thank you so much for coming. It's really amazing. When I first walked in here, I, you know, I, I, I mean, it didn't occur to me that we would actually fill the place. So I'm like, I'm so incredibly grateful that you're all here um, tonight. So thank you for coming. And um, I want to thank all the people who preceded me up here, um, Matt Hayes and Tom Waugh um, and Ezra Winton and Svetla Turnin of Cinema Politica. And especially I want to thank Ryan Conrad who initiated this how, you know, how many months ago? I don't know. It's, it's been a long haul, so it's really great to finally be here. Um, let's see, okay. Uh, I usually don't say a great deal before the, um, a screening, um, partially because I really prefer for people to ha um, see the film and have their own experience and, and not, you know, like be guided into a narrow understanding of it by what I say, but um, since this is officially a lecture series, I, I will say a few things. Um, as it says up here, the film has two overarching concepts. The, the first is to put ACT UP right smack dab in the middle of mainstream history where it rightfully belongs. Um, and, the, and the other is to inspire additional activism. Um, United in Anger is about a particular time and a particular place. 
um, and the, the strategies and tactics that ACT UP used um, are not necessarily available or would they be effective or appropriate in you know, this, this time and this place. Um, but the universal, oh, I get to do that. The, the universal lesson of ACT UP is that a small group of people extremely focused on, on their goals and knowing far more than the opposition can really change the world. Um, so it's possible for ACT UP to serve as a, as a model, but your responsibility is, is to take this model and figure out how it needs to be changed and how you, you can um, do this, make the changes in your world that you want. Um, I think, right, oh, okay, yeah. Um, after a few years, I'll get used to this. Um, um, this, okay, this film grew out of two very large bodies of work. The um, AIDS activist video collection of the New York Public Library and the ACT UP Oral History Project. The AIDS activist video collection of the New York Public Library is a collection that I put together in the late 90s. It, it consists of over a thousand hours of footage shot mostly by collectives but some by individuals and I spent two years going through every single frame of that footage in, um, in order to, to make this film. And the ACT UP Oral History Project, as Michael said, was a program that Sarah Schulman and I started in 2001, actually in June of 2001, which was the 20th anniversary of AIDS. Um, Sarah was in LA and she was driving her car and I, um, Sarah only learned to drive when she was 35 or so. She's a really terrible driver. Um, <laughs> and she was listening to the radio, and she, she heard this report and nearly went off the road, probably on Mulholland Drive or something like that. Um, anyway, this, this radio broadcast said that at first Americans were upset by AIDS, and then they got used to it. Um, and she said, we have to do something about this incredible erasure of the efforts of thousands of AIDS activists who f really forced the U.S. government and forced the mainstream media to deal with the AIDS crisis. Um, and the, the, um, the other concept that um, is really important to know, and this comes out of both the AIDS activist video movement um, and AIDS activism in, in general is that people with AIDS their caregivers and the people in the trenches fighting the crisis with them are the true experts in the disease. It's not, not the straight men in white coats. Oh, next slide, okay. There you go, it's up, okay, it's up there. Uh, it's, not those, it's not those guys in the white coats or in the suits, the bureaucrats and the scientists, it's really the people who have been, were living with the disease and, and, and dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis who are the ec experts. And, and that's why the film doesn't have those guys in white coats and suits. It's, um, it's the people from ACT UP. Um, and in, in any case, those, those, those guys who are the, the so-called experts came to understand that the people in ACT UP were right anyway. So. In the, in the end, everybody came to think the same. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, so um, just to follow up on the ACT UP Oral History Project, we've done 149 interviews so far. Um, we have 80 people on our um, waiting list to be interviewed. We hope to finish in two to three years. Uh, anyone can be interviewed by sending a, um, an email to Sarah, so it, it's all a self-selected list. But you, you can download complete transcripts and see video clips of 
108 of the interviews on the website, which is www.actuporalhistory.org. Um, so I think that's enough for now. And let's look at the film. And afterwards, I'll have a little more to say. And then uh, we can have a conversation among ourselves. So thanks again for coming. Uh, oh, oh, let's see, one other thing. The, f the French subtitles are new. So um, if there's anything that's you know, like a bad translation or you want changed, we can do it. So, um, so tell me. Thanks a lot. Living in New York at that time was like crazy because people were getting sick every day. Three, four, five, six people that you hear about being sick. We were very scared that the Reagan administration was going to put people with AIDS in internment camps. And I think that we came close to that in this country. How deeply are Americans worried about AIDS? A Los Angeles Times poll found that 50% of Americans favor quarantine for AIDS victims. 15% said AIDS victims should be tattooed. It was about people in power not caring about the lives of people who didn't have power. Kramer delivered a fiery speech, and I remember he asked uh, like half of the audience to stand up, and he said, you're all going to be dead in six months. Now what are we going to do about it? Unleash power. We are a diverse, nonpartisan group of individuals united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. Release those drugs! Release those drugs! When we're activists, when we really act up, we have a big impact and we get what we're demanding. And when we're silent, we don't. We'll never be silent again. Act up! We'll never be silent again. Act up! where I really got a sense of community. I mean, I got the feeling then that people felt that lives depended on them. Healthcare is right! Healthcare is right! I don't fight back! Fight it! These drug companies are profiteering on our lives and that we cannot accept that anymore. Jim, thank you for that magnificent film. And now uh, we'll let you start your PowerPoint. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, that was really, really exciting to sit here and watch it with you. Um, um, let me um, elaborate a little on what I started to say earlier. Um, Boy, where are we? <laughs> um, I think I said, in talking about the AIDS activist video makers who made this possible, um, I guess I should say that I started filming ACT UP in June of 1987, but I, uh, I filmed on 16 millimeter. And not only did I film on 16 millimeter, but I processed my own film because I was an experimental filmmaker. Um, so, and, and made several films about ACT UP, but the vast majority of footage in this film is from other people. It's from the um, half a dozen collectives, 30 to 40 different individuals um, whose work is represented in the AIDS Activist Video Collection of the New York Pub Public Library. And in fact, there's only, um, there's only a handful of shots in the film that are mine, um, including some of the footage in um, outside of St. Patrick's Cathedral at the Stop the Church action. 
Um, I, I have to say that I was always very ambivalent about that um, action, but um, I think um, it's, it's one of those parts of the film that really grab people, so I'm certainly glad it's there, but um, as I said that I thought I hadn't filmed, and then about 10 years ago, my boyfriend and I were painting our apartment and moved all the furniture in the bedroom, and there behind a bookshelf were two video cassettes labeled St. Patrick's, and it turned out to be the videotape that I had shot um, that morning, so, so that's how my footage got into my own film. Um, so working in collectives really made it easy to collect film. Um, lots of people equals lots of footage. So um, that, that made it a lot easier. But when it came to editing that footage, um, if you had six people who had to, each of them had to make a, um, agree to each cut that makes the editing process enormously difficult. And that's literally what happened with Testing the Limits, six people. Um, Diva TV was even worse. There were 12 to 40 people in, in Diva TV. And it became impossible for them to edit that way. So what they did is they broke the, uh, they broke the um, pieces into, into smaller sections and smaller groups of people had um, responsibility for um, each section, and I think I'm going to come back to that notion um, in a in a in a minute. Um, um, what do we? Okay. Um, so I think I said before that there's over a thousand hours of footage in the in the collection, and that includes finished tapes and raw camera original. It was mostly shot from 1987 to 1995. Um, um, it's really incredible that it's in the New York Public Library. I mean, um, in the United States now, we're, I think, coming to the end of an era where the belief in the, the common good has, has been almost eradicated by um, people in the uh, Republican Party mostly with the, um, the Democrats going along with it. And I think um, you in Canada are sort of suffering from, from that sort of notion somewhat here. Um, uh, I was horrified to hear that the, uh, the theater of the National Film Board in, um, was closed here. Um, in America, we've never had um, a national film theater, so... Um, we always look to other countries thinking that um, they believe in culture in a way that we never have. So it's, it's a little disconcerting to, to hear that um, maybe some of our bad ideas are rubbing off on other people. Um, but I, I guess that's always been the case, hasn't it? With the, um, the largest, most horrible country in the world infecting everybody else. Um, so I... I urge you to resist. Um, but the, um, the idea for the collection in the New York Public Library um, originated with Patrick Moore, who you saw briefly in the film. He was the head of the estate project for artists with AIDS and knew that somehow we had to save this material so that um, people, people like me could use it in, in the future. Uh, and so the, the estate project hired me to look into the possibility of creating a collection. And the first thing I did was to do research to find out who might be able to, um, to house all this material. And I found in doing this research that there was only one institution in the United States that was, could possibly house it. One institution that had both the interest in material related to the AIDS crisis, gay-related material, and also had the capacity to deal with over a thousand hours of, of footage, and that was the New York Public Library. Um, but, but it's really great because uh, right, right now you have to go to the New York Public Library that 
famous building on 42nd Street with you know, the Beaux-Arts building with the lions out front. And you go into the main reading room. The main reading room of the New York Public Library is the largest room in the United States. Um, it is 900 feet by uh, 150 feet, or what, what is that, about 300 meters by 50 meters. Um, and you walk all the way through it, and at the back is the rare, is the Brooke Astor Rare Books Reading Room. And uh, you go in there, and it's a wood card room, and people are sitting around reading 18th century manuscripts and um, letters from um, famous poets, and you sit there and watch VHS tapes, and it's a really wonderful um, contrast. Um, and I should say that um, people under the age of 18 are normally not allowed in, in there um, because of the fragility of the collection, but ACT UP insisted that everyone should be, have access to its materials. And so there's a special agreement that um, people under the age of 18 can, can get access to, to the videotapes and uh, the paper materials of ACT UP. Um, let me talk a little bit about the editing process. Um, people ask, um, how long did it take to make this film? And um, my answer is 25 years, 10 years, or four years, depending on how you look at it. Uh, 25 years because, as I said earlier, I first filmed ACT UP in June of 1987, and I've been um, dealing with uh, ACT UP and the AIDS crisis in my film work ever since. Ten years ago, Sarah Schulman and I started the ACT UP Oral History Project, and it took four years of intense editing to make this film. Um, I spent a couple years creating a rough cut, which was approximately three hours long, and I always knew that I had to bring someone on, someone who didn't live through the crisis, someone who wasn't immersed in, in, in it, to make it understandable to all of you who, who did not lived through it, and um, that person is, was the editor, Ali Cotterill, so I put her name up there, because she did such an incredible job. Um, so the, the, the rough cut that I gave her was almost entirely archival footage, because as an experimental filmmaker, I think, you know, it's all there, it's all there in the footage, and she said, no, you have to explain it to people. Um, and, and, that, and that's what she did, you know, like culling the the perfect quotes from the ACT UP Oral History Project to explain and, and deepen the, um, the um, discussion around, around the uh, demonstrations. Um, let's see. So the, the important thing about ACT UP is the simultaneity of, of action, that lots of things are always going on at are on at once, and it was very difficult to convey that in the film. And um, but there would might be three or four zaps in a week, and planning for a national or international um, conference. And then there's always the the teach-ins, and every at every meeting there would be the first 15 minutes. People would talk about, okay, here here's the latest um, drug information. Here's the latest um, life-saving information that. Um, people with AIDS need. So, so there was all, you know, like this roiling of activity that, that we tried really hard to show and using the, the meeting footage and, and all those other things, the discussion about the affinity groups and, and sex. There's, there was always sex. I love, you know, whenever I watch the film, in the very beginning when Greg Bordowitz says, makes that offhanded comment about um, cruising, if, if the audience laughs, I know people are with the film, so I was very happy when you, when you laughed at that, that comment. Um, um, what's really important about ACT UP <coughs> is that the story of ACT UP is the story of the, of, of the group. Um, it's, it's, not, it's about individuals, it's about people rising to the occasion. Um, it's, it's really about the zeitgeist and, um, and people just doing everything they can in, in the moment to, to solve the crisis. Um, and in, in the U.S. at least, there's this huge push to make 
documentaries that are very uniform, that they're supposed to have only five characters because supposedly people can't deal with more than five people on the screen. Um, but of course, that's ridiculous. And, it, and it would, it, you couldn't convey the real story of ACT UP that way because, I mean, it would have been a lie that it's about hundreds of people. Um, the dozens of people who are in this film and, and hundreds of people who are, who are dead and obviously couldn't be in the film, even in the archival footage, and, and, and it, all those people who went to those meetings uh, in New York and around the US and around the world. Um, so, you know, that, that's what I tried to convey, and that's, you know, like, that's what's really important. And I, I meant this film to be a blueprint for activism. And as I said earlier, you have to use all your creative energy to um, further your political ends. And, and that's, that's um, the, the great lesson of ACT UP. Um, and fi finally, I, um, I think I went out of order, but I tried to make a film from ACT UP's point of view, but if, obviously it's my idea of what ACT UP's point of view is. So um, this, the ACT UP Oral History Project ultimately will all be online, all, well, there are 250 hours, there'll probably be 500 hours by the time we're finished. The, um, the uh, New York Public Library just got a grant to digitize all that footage, so Ultimately, a thousand hours will be on the internet, and everybody can make a film. So, you know, let a thousand films bloom. Um, so, I get, yeah, I guess I said that there was too much to show in a ninety-minute film. Um, in fact, there was there was one point in the in the editing process that I thought that I was going to make the sorrow and the pity version of ACT UP that it was going to be four hours long. And I realized that wasn't necessary. What was necessary was for there to be a succinct introduction um, to ACT UP. And, and as long as the ACT UP Oral History Project exists, there, you know, there's the 250-hour version. So the four-hour version is hardly necessary. Um, so what I tried to do was make a film that grew out of the AIDS activist video movement that, that adhered to it, its tenets and reflected its most important philosophical and political positions. That is that the, the, people, the people with AIDS are the experts and they're the people who should be speaking on the screen and not people from drug companies and not people from the government, but, but us, the people. So on that note, let, you know, we'll get the people here to talk and ask questions and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, do we have mics? Yeah. So we have circulating microphones. If you have a question, please put your hand up and you will be approached. Um, I must say, I, you talk about the editing process, but Frederick Wiseman talks about 100 hours and cutting that down. And I, I just still really marvel at the fact that you had that much, I mean, 10 times, you had a thousand hours. You know, I think it's really impressive. And, uh, and I think it was smart to make it 90 minutes. I mean, Michael Moore says, don't make a documentary over 90 minutes. He broke his own rule with Bowling for Columbine. But I think you, you know, I think you did I think it's a very good thing because it's succinct, it's punchy. It leaves us wanting more, which I think is the way to, often the way to end a film, so. Well, I think it's appropriate, because uh, you're here, that uh, the other person who says make movies 90 minutes is John Waters. <laughs> and Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody Allen says that too. Don't make a comedy more than 90 minutes. Who has uh, the microphone right now? Yeah, there we go. Um, so a quick comment first maybe and then my question. Um, it was a really moving movie. Well, a touching movie. Um, I do think a good idea would maybe be to project Ryan Conrad short movies just after it. Uh, uh -huh. That's about, about how our generation don't remember HIV. Um, just because yesterday I was to this information sessions about these clinical studies of, uh, that's called Hypergay, which is the PrEP, pre-exposition prophylaxy, which will use a placebo to test the, these pills. Um, and there was only 20 people in the room to hear about how they were going to do this. And so 
everything that's been shown and how people were integrated into uh, those clinical studies that seems to be fading away now uh, as the epidemic seems to be less and less uh, an important uh, thing. Uh, though still, it's really something that needs to be talked of. Why should we still use placebo in trying new prevention ways of using HIV? Um, so my comments, though, was less uh, on that and more on... Uh, we've seen a lot of people being arrested in the movie, but we don't hear about what was the follow-up, what happened to those people who got arrested, how ACT UP did uh, follow-up with those people. Was there criminal charges? Was there, like... It's because it's also something that's really striking here right now. Like now that they, the students' movement is done, there's still all those people that have been arrested, and nobody cares anymore about those people. And people said, "Oh, let them face us. They did that, and it was for the greater good." So, how did ACT UP react to those arrestations too? Um, yeah, oh, that's a lot to react to. Um, yeah, Ryan's film is great. Everyone should see it. It's real, it, you know, like con conveys um, what it was like in in a remarkable way for someone who was not there. Um, and the, and the, I would have thought that the battle over placebos would have would have been won a long time ago. But it's it's amazing that um, you know when it, I mean they, the. People, um, doctors still can't tell the difference between aspirin and AIDS drugs. I don't, you know, it's it's remarkable to me. But um, to answer your last question about um, the uh, the arrests, um, ACT UP had this um, incredible infrastructure. There were lots of lawyers um, who had been recruited in ACT UP to take care of people. Plus, plus there was always a system whereby. Any, anyone who planned to get arrested, they had their names, their addresses, contact, and all so all this information. And then there were people out waiting outside the, the police pre precincts, so that waiting until everybody got out. Um, but because of the power of the group, generally, people um, were, they were arrested, but, but they weren't, um, the expression is, put through the system which meant that they, they weren't um, arraigned, they weren't indicted, generally. That they were given a desk at appearance ticket, and generally, after six months, it was wiped off their record, supposedly. But um, on rare occasions, people were arrested um, in, for instance, at the Republican Convention in 1992, um, Scott Sawyer was charged with attempted murder for, a, um, for allegedly biting a police officer, um, and, they, and he was um, forcibly tested for HIV in jail. Um, it took two years to get him off. Um, I mean, he wasn't in jail for two years. No, no, he was in jail only for a short time. But um, I mean, he didn't—he didn't even bite the guy. I mean, it was just completely. Uh, made up, um, and then um, the um, the worst incident was at a, um, a pro protest outside a police pre precinct in New York, where um, the police grabbed um, this guy um, Chris. I can't. I can't. I'm blanking on Chris's last name. But anyway, they dragged him into the police precinct and beat him, uh, and he has permanent uh, neurological damage. Um, so, so that's the worst bit of police violence that happened. And th then there, were, there are cases where people actually got arrested intentionally. Uh, needle exchange, I wish needle exchange could have gotten into this um, film. Uh, people in ACT UP forced um, New York State to change its law about um, that people, uh, it became legal to, for people in New York to have needles. Um, and it was an important part of stopping the epidemic among uh, intravenous drug users. Uh, they used the necessity defense, which meant they spent 10 weeks convincing a judge that what they, they broke this law with the intention that a much worse law, um, you know, something much worse was happening 
and therefore um, they were acquitted and the law changed in, in the state of New York and ultimately in most of the United States. First of all, thank you for the template um, template of grassroots activism. And I'll let everybody know if they're hiring, please let me know. Um, uh, second of all, there, I don't know if you know about this, but there was uh, about last year, there was some controversy when someone made a poster um, and then it circulated over the internet that said, I party, I'm positive, I bear back, I'm responsible. And there was a kind of a backlash, an intergenerational backlash between um, different groups of HIV AIDS activists. And I was wondering um, what your position was or what your experience was with the whole resurgence of the bareback movement. Um, yeah, I have to say I was quite, when I first saw that poster, I was quite taken aback. Uh, and it comes from Toronto, right? Yeah, um, AIDS Action Now. Um, you know, people have been trying to do prevention for now in close to 30 years. And in the 80s and early 90s, um, um, because we, we were so close to the devastation of the disease, um, I think the fear factor really worked. And it did, it did um, um, cut down on you know, unsafe sex. But now with the cocktail, things are a lot more complicated. And, um, you know, I'm not a prevention expert. Um, in, in a way, it's really hard for me to talk about the contemporary situation because in, um, in a real sense, I live in 1987. Uh, that just, you know, with the oral history project, with making this film, I'm constantly reliving what happened in the late 80s and early 90s. So um, it's, it's really hard for me to know what's going on now. But uh, I think there need to be lots of, lots of ways of dealing with um, prevention. And um, so I guess I'm, I'm basically for trying all of them. Um, that, one, that one took me a lot of time to understand. But, um, but it is, you know, it is possible to bear back and be responsible. That there are certain, you know, there are circumstances where it is. I mean, where if if you're on the cocktail and you're undetectable, your um, the possibility of transmitting the virus is really low. And I think we have to take that into cons consideration. Um, in fact, I heard. Um, I understand that if we could get half the 30 million people in the world on, on the drugs and, and undetectable, that the transmission rate would start going down and we could get rid of AIDS within a generation. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is. But there is no political will to do that. So who's really at fault here? Bonjour, je vais m'exprimer en français. Euh, moi, j'étais à Act Up dans les années 90 à Paris, et euh, c'est vrai que je les ai chez mu parce que ça m'a amené dans le passé et, et rappelé des amis que j'ai perdus. Et euh, je me souviens qu'à l'époque, c'est vrai, on ne savait pas grand-chose sur sur la maladie, mais on en savait toujours plus que les médecins. Et euh, le changement que Et euh, je pense que, enfin selon moi en tout cas euh, en France et, euh, et notamment, euh, enfin je parlerai pour mon pays, mais euh, le changement que Act Up nous a apporté, c'est que euh, les patients ont, ont, se sont informés étaient plus informés, je pense maintenant, s'informent au sujet de leur maladie et luttent. Ce ne plus des patients passifs face à leur médecin, mais ce sont des patients actifs qui luttent pour leur, pour leur santé, pour leurs droits. Et ça, c'est ce qu'Actop nous a donné. C'est un, un cadeau. Mais, attendez. Quand...
Et l'autre chose, c'est que je me souviens qu'avant enfin avant, avant les années 90, ont été des années effectivement terribles. Hein, on a perdu énormément, c'était une hécatombe. Euh, avant les années 90, euh, quand on sortait, euh, on clubait à Paris, on, on toquait à une porte et euh, c'était une petite fenêtre qui s'ouvrait euh, pour nous laisser entrer. On était, euh, ça, c'était euh, l'avant Act Up. Et l'après Act Up, ça a été des terrasses de, de gays et de lesbiennes. Act Up, ça nous a donné aussi la fierté, la visibilité. On n'allait pas crever, on n'allait pas crever comme ça en silence. Et, euh, et ça, ça nous a donné cette force-là de, de nous montrer d'être fiers. Et euh, bah merci à Act Up. Et, euh, il faut continuer parce qu'il y a encore du, du travail à faire. Il y a, il y a les salles d'injection pour lesquelles il faut, il faut lutter. Il faut qu'on les ait, ces salles, pour les usagers de drogue. Il y a les prisons. Il y a aussi les, le droit des femmes, des étrangers aux soins, l'accès aux soins. Ça, ce n'est pas terminé. La lutte continue. Et euh, voilà. <rire> merci. Thank you. Um, I should say that Act Up Paris is showing this film uh, one week from today in, in Paris. So um, thank you so much for saying that and um, tell your friends to go see it. <laughs> Got to get that advertisement in. All right. Um, you have amassed such an amazing archive of video footage. Um, a particular point in the film that I found was really interesting was about the posters produced by and for ACT UP. I was wondering, is there any sort of archive of those? Is there any sort of collection um, available anywhere in the world of those posters? Um, yeah, the, um, the New York Public Library has, um, has a collection of um, ACT UP posters and ACT UP Um, the, oh, actually, all the ACT UP papers from ACT UP New York went to the New York Public Library. And there, there are other collections around the world. I, um, I'm kind of blanking on where, where they are right now. Uh, Is there any plan to publish a, a coffee table book on, of them? Because they're beautiful. No, I mean, there'd be great, it'd be a great thing to have. I would get it for sure. Uh, um, yeah, people people are trying to do that. There there have been a couple of um, there have been more than a couple. There have been lots of um, exhibits around the world. Um, in fact, we we did an exhibition that was at Harvard and then at uh, the White Columns Gallery in um, New York that included um, all of the ACT UP oral history project on 14 monitors. And, um, and also a, a poster show. And there was just a Grand Fury show in New York, which is traveling, and I'm not sure where it's going. Um, I, I, it, might be, there, it might be going to the um, Art Gallery of Ontario, but I'm, I won't swear to that. But yeah, there are, there are collections. In fact, um, even the New York Public Library has one of the, um, the, the bus posters of kissing doesn't kill, so it's 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 what ten meters long and three meters high. It's really incredible. Oh yes, up here. Uh, having seen the past of uh, <clears throat> AIDS, I'd like to know what you think the future. Uh, can you speak? Yeah. Can you speak up a bit? Oh, ha having seen the past, I'd like to know what you think the future is for AIDS. Well, I guess if. I had my druthers, there wouldn't be a future for AIDS. Um, it, um, it would just be over. But um, yeah, as I said, you know, I, I'm really not the person to answer that question um, in a strange way. I, I mean, I think there needs to be more activism. I mean, as long as there are pe people getting infected and there are um, even more than that, people not getting the health care that they need. I mean, I, you know, it's a little weird coming from a country where there is still not universal health care, and even with Obamacare, uh, we won't, there'll be 30 million people without um, health insurance. So, you know, when I come to really advanced countries where there is universal health care, um, you know, I, I, I can't exactly speak to, to the situation, but Uh, you know, certainly in Africa and in the poorer parts of Asia where people are not getting the care they, they need, 
I mean, Western countries should be giving them money and allowing them to develop the, the infrastructure for dealing with it. I mean, I, that's Sorry. One of the things that comes up repeatedly in the film, though, that we keep hearing over and over again is we need, basically they're saying we need universal health care. There's no beds. There's nothing for us, homeless people. I'm wondering how, I mean, obviously it was a compromise of a compromise of a compromise, but I'm wondering how you feel about Obamacare. Romney was going to dismantle it. I'm wondering how you feel about it. Well, well, at the time, I, I, um, when, it, when it first passed, I felt betrayed because they took the, the public option out of it, that I felt like it really wasn't um, that much to ask for allowing everybody to opt in to, to Medicare, which, which is our system for people over 65, which I am very much looking forward to participating in in <laughs> three and a half years. Um, although I, I get health insurance because my boyfriend works for a company that gives health care um, insurance to domestic partners, although he has to pay $2,000 a year and then pay taxes on the $5,000 a year of imputed income that his company pays towards my health insurance. So. And, you know, people who are married uh, don't have to pay that. But uh, even though we ha now have gay marriage in New York, it doesn't, it doesn't work for those things. Um, great. Yeah. Great. Well, Sorry. yeah. It was a great film, but I'm a little puzzled and I need a little clarification. Because on the one hand, the film suggests that in the later years, the protests moved from just the need for more drugs to a question of human rights and that medical care should be available to all as a human right. And yet you've pointed out in your remarks that because of the improved medication, there is less activism now than there used to be. And you've just pointed out that the United States still has an inadequate system of medical care. So well, my question is, and why I need the clarification is, what happened to the demand of human rights within the gay community? Um, I wish there were a simple answer to that. Um, there, there are two things. First, the, um, the, the power of ACT UP diminished. Oh, it, it took over a period of years. And it was the cause of the, there was a number of causes of that. One is that so many people died and it was incredibly um, debilitating. And the other um, major aspect to that was the change from the Reagan and Bush administrations to the, um, to the Clinton years. And Clinton, you know, Clinton's famous line about I feel your pain, that, that was actually said to Bob Rafsky, um, the guy who appears a couple times in the film, including near the end, um, he, where he gives that impassioned speech about um, Mark's soul being able to rest in peace. Um, and it, so what it did, it was sort of, it became this squishy target. And it was really hard to work against that. And then, th but, even more than that was that the issues became much more complicated and uh, people never really figured out how to organize around those larger philosophical issues that in a way it was easier to demonstrate for, for particular drugs or for, for the FDA to do a certain thing, for the NIH to do things. But, those, those larger issues of, of universal health care and then and even you know like universal human rights that um, that takes long years of work and so, yeah I mean it's interesting to to contrast act up with occupy the, my, my great uh, um, irony around occupy is that I edited this film two blocks from Zuccotti Park and I hardly took my face out of the computer to go down there and see what was happening. Um, but 
there they faced a completely opposite issue. What, what Occupy wanted to do was completely change people's idea of the capitalist structure. They, they were saying, okay, you have to look at it differently. Um, and where ACT UP could be very specific about its demands and, and study the issue and say, okay, the way to get drugs is to do, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, that would have been completely counterproductive for, for Occupy. So, the, um, I, you know, I think these struggles, I'm, I'm going to sort of do a little cop out here. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, revolution is the work of young people. And um, it, it's up to the, you know, the people who's, you know, like the, who will inherit the world to make it a better place. And they're going to have to figure out how to do it. And I, I'm afraid I don't have the answer. <laughs> but I do recall there were real serious rifts um, with ACT UP. Uh, and you, you touch on it. You touch on those philosophical differences, exactly what your question was getting at. And that's when a lot of queer nations started, where people said, we're going to start our own kind of separate chapters where we want to be doing the same kind of actions, mm -hmm. but not just talking about concerns of gay men or lesbians. We want to talk about race. We want to talk about gender and class difference. And they were talking about all those things. So it was interesting those those divisions were, were starting back then. Yeah, um, yeah Queer Nation actually wasn't a, a rift. I mean, I think it was, it was seen as, as an enlargement or as that, that okay, we're gay people who don't, you know, like there's, there's all this emphasis on AIDS, but there are these issues, that, other issues that we have, political issues that we need to deal with. And let's, let's look for some medium to, to deal with them, deal with those. Okay. We got time for one more. Who's got, who's got the mic now? Oh, I do. <laughs> uh, so one thing that strikes me with um, the movements of ACT UP and just generally, it seems that every generation or every other generation has its movement. Um, but through whatever means, whether it's just a change in the people or some systemic thing, we forget how the protests were done and we forget those methods of protest. And one thing that struck me um, was just watching the arrests um, of ACT UP, if people would would sit down or lay down and just peacefully go, which is very different from now, I find, how, how people react to being arrested. And uh, I guess my question is, how do we sort of get that information of how, because we have to redistribute every time how to protest and how to react to police and how to behave. And my question is, how do we get that information from protests and sort of turn it into a timeless thing and have that knowledge and maintain that knowledge? And should we? Um, well, I think that's why I made this film, so that um, there, there is a blueprint. I don't, you know, I don't think this is the only way of going about it. And, and I think people have to reinvent uh, it every time. But, you know, if, if, the, if people in ACT UP hadn't seen the footage of um, civil rights protesters, uh, that, that, you know, knowledge would have been much harder to convey, although there were people who were there to teach it. You know, that little section about the civil, civil disobedience uh, training is, is there, you know, literally teaching people how to get arrested. Um, so there, I think it's a combination of things, things like this, movies and... And, and there's, uh, if you go to the ACT UP website, act, actupny.org, there's actually a handbook on how to do civil disobedience that was written by ACT UP. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you've got Yes Men doing culture jamming too. That's right. Yes. I'm, do, I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing the Yes Men next Thursday in New York. And Andy Bicklebaum and I are going to... Um, teach kids how to do this, I guess. <laughs> do we have, we had one more? We had one more? We have one more in the front here? Oh, okay. Sorry, one more there. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for this film. I'm very moved by it. And um, I guess I started having sex and my friends started having sex when ACT UP started to hit the news. <laughs> so needless to say, this movement had a big impact in my life. And uh, I guess looking forward, I'm just, I'm wondering about how you would like to see this film used and how you want support with that. And I love the idea of making the VHS footage accessible through other means um, and, and having that, like you say, just multiply. Um, I th yeah, I think that we need multiple creative forms of activism and we need to span continents, obviously, and uh, to have people reshape those tools in their own ways and to, to suit the needs within our own communities. And I guess on that note, I'm just wondering about um, language too. And if, if this, there's the great subtitling in French and it's fantastic that's there. And I'm wondering about Spanish. I'm wondering about other languages too. Um, to answer the subtitling first, we have it in Spanish, German, Portuguese, and Arabic so far. And French. And French, well, yeah. Um, uh, the Arabic um, exists because we did a tour of um, Israel and Palestine, and we actually the first place we showed it outside the United States was in Ramallah. Um, and um, the um, uh, one woman said she, she was so inspired by seeing a group that spent years uh, using every tactic they could think of to, you know, get to achieve their goals, and she saw that like the Palestinian struggle. And um, then the straight guy in the audience said it was the first time he'd ever seen a film where gay people were shown positively. Um, but also, the uh, it was translated by um, a woman in Gaza, and she apparently she used the word normal to translate straight. Uh, <laughs> So everybody was a little annoyed by that, but we've had it. Re we <laughs> but we've had we just had it retranslated by this great guy and who lives in Stockholm. He's a Palestinian who lives in Stockholm. So, um, oh, but to go directly to your question about um, how how the film should be used. I mean, um, one thing is um, screenings like this in colleges and universities. I've done a bunch of them and I want to do a lot more. Uh, Cinema Politica is distributing, distributing it um, in Canadian um, colleges and universities wherever they show. Um, but also we're doing it in grassroots organization. AIDS Action Now in Toronto has shown it in um, a bunch of, you know, like little screenings for grassroots people. Uh, there are a couple of screenings in suburbs of Vancouver for youth groups and um, HIV groups. Um, so, so there are all sorts of things like that, as well as showing it in film festivals and um, any cinema that wants to show it. I just want to announce that tomorrow afternoon, Jim will be conducting a limited enrollment hands-on workshop on AIDS media activism with students in fine arts, communications, sexuality and women's studies, and history. So there's still a few places in the workshop left. If you're interested in signing up, please register with Asher Fairstein, who is uh, involved with the HIV AIDS lecture series. Asher, are you around? Right there. So if you need to talk to Asher or me, if you can't find Asher. Um, and we should make a few final acknowledgements that uh, to thank v Vive Healthcare in partnership with Shire Biochem and Gilead Sciences, our principal sponsors, our amazing collabor collaborators from Cinema Politica, Ezra Winton and Svetla Turnin, uh, Jason Millen for the, Mil Milan for the graphic and web design, CUTV for the video footage and archiving the event, the HIV AIDS teaching team, Professor Vivian Namast and teaching assistant Alex McClelland, internship coordinator Giselle Suzar Morin, uh, and Ryan Conrad for initiating the idea for this event and follow-up liaison, as well as coordinating tomorrow's workshop, Thomas Waugh for his work as director of the AIDS, HIV AIDS Project and PIMP. Uh, <laughs> Asher Fairstein <laughs> for his wonderful work as coordinator of the HIV AIDS lecture series. Also, we really want to thank Lawrence Ul 
Colin for his translation. Thank you very much. And thanks to Johnny, our projectionist. Also, yay. Also, sorry, uh, there is a, a very uh, interesting documentary that's going to screen on Saturday night, um, and it's about um, women and zero conversion and the criminalization of HIV. Um, it's called Femme et Serial Positive Denonçant L'Injustice, and it will be screening on Saturday night in the Deceve Cinema that's in the Webster Library, and that it starts at 6 o'clock, uh, and it's free. So please consider uh, checking that out. Um, as well, there will be a, uh, a reception for you now at the Simon de Beauvoir. So students in the AIDS course and the volunteers are all invited to that. Um, and I believe there was one other announcement that somebody uh, wanted to make. If you could make that quickly, please. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing documentary. It was really powerful. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm here from Hidden Hands. We're a community organization that provides free medical, legal, and social services in NDG. And uh, a year ago, our street work program got cut. And part of what our street workers used to do is give out free clean needles in the neighborhood. And ever since then, there's been no free clean needle distribution program in the neighborhood. And it's a real problem for injection drug users and um, for HIV prevention. So um, we've entered this online competition called the Aviva Community Fund Competition. And uh, basically you can go vote for us online once a day until Monday, and we might get a chance to qualify for the semifinals and maybe get a chance of winning $75,000, which is enough to hire two street workers for one year. So if you wanna support us, um, we're so close to making it. We're like thir in 13th position. Um, and we only need like 100 votes. Seriously, it would make a huge difference if you, if you have uh, five seconds a day. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. To, thank you. So to vote, you go to headandhands.ca and all the information is there. It's the Aviva Community Fund. Thank you. I just want to say that the 20th year of the HIV AIDS lecture series continues in January. Mia Donovan, local filmmaker, will be here to present her amazing film about a Quebec porn starlet who went to California and zero converted called Inside Lara Rocks. I've seen this film. I'm showing it in my documentary class uh, later this semester. It's a remarkable film. She's a remarkable filmmaker. She's going to be here in late January, so please come back for that. And I really want to thank Jim Hubbard for coming here from New York and presenting this film. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was excellent. 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 <laughs>